This is Linda Becker with Cinelinks.com, and I'm speaking today with John Paisano, acclaimed composer for film and television. Thank you for your time today, John. Yeah, thanks for having me. Sure. Now, you studied music composition at Berkeley College of Music, and their program for film and television scoring is world-renowned. Out of the various techniques and technologies you learned about way back then, are there any that you still use today when writing and editing music? Yeah, it's a good question. The, you know, when I went to school, it a, it, you know, the, the, the process about going and scoring film has changed so dramatically between then and now as far as from a technological aspect mm -hmm. um, that there's definitely still techniques and applications that are still relevant that I was using while I was in school, but they're, they're, they're kind of more broader strokes, but the intricacies of scoring uh, film and television when it comes to the technology have changed so dramatically that any type of technological um, advancements that have been that, that I was that actually I took part in when I was at Berkeley the advancements in technology have completely wiped those out of, compared to where we are today <laughs> so a lot of that stuff um, and, 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 and to Berkeley's credit they're so far ahead of the curve with a lot of that stuff at least uh, especially at the time I was at school it was kind of um, the renaissance of technology being brought into the music world you know the development of Pro Tools was becoming more into play and Mm -hmm. We were getting into the computer for a lot more of the recording, and people were going away from tape and starting to get into hard disk recording. And it was, it was definitely kind of the beginning of that time. So things, it was kind of the Wild West, you know. Things were definitely changing at a very, very um, fast pace, and uh, it was an interesting time to kind of be in a technologically driven application such as film scoring. Um, because we rely so heavily now on the computers and, and everything, um, and right. it, it changed pretty dramatically over that time I was in school. So uh, to the, the, the short answer to your question is um, there's not much that I learned in school from a technological standpoint that I still use today, but from a, you know, compositional standpoint and from mm -hmm. a, um, functional standpoint as far as, you know, looking at scenes and how to go about scoring them and, you know, relationships and, you know, how to deal with directors, how to deal with that translation bridge when it comes to talking with music to, with people who aren't necessarily mu very musical as, as far as their vocabulary is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, all those things um, I, are, are still in play today and I, and, I, and I definitely learned a great deal while I was there. So it, it was definitely a um, it, it, Berkeley College of Music. Music is a great, great um, film scoring program, and it's also just a great school for modern music. Oh, it is. It definitely is. Now, are you involved with any non-musical business meetings or processes as far as getting soundtracks out? I mean, do you work with the studios yeah, I mean, or the network? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the the job of film scoring, you know, people always come to me and they say, oh, you know, you're in the music business, but I, honest to God, I feel like with film scoring, you're more part of the film business than you really are even the music business. And mm -hmm. being part of the film business, you know, it's interesting being in a job where you're creating music for something, and the reality is music's not the most important thing um, in the grand scheme of film, nor should it be. It's, it's, it's more about, the, you know, the film, the dialogue, and the music is just kind of a functional, um, a very important aspect of the film but it's definitely not you know king of what you're working on versus when you're doing an album or you're you're working on a you know a song or, or something the music is front and center but when you're when you're doing scores it's definitely there's a reason why it's called underscore right. um so back to your original question the 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 film scoring job entails so many other aspects besides just the actual physical writing notes um, for the scene that you're scoring or for the movie that you're scoring or show that you're scoring. There's, there's a lot of mm -hmm. other um, aspects to the job that come into play, whether it's, you know, dealing with politics, trying to sort out, you know, if some person wants this, you know, let's say a producer wants this type of music in the scene, but the director's got a different idea, trying to figure out if there's a common ground or a commonality that, that can – um, there, there's a, there's there's a lot of there, there there's a lot of problem solving when it comes to the you know political side of music's a very subjective thing you know so a lot of people have different ideas of what they want for stuff and and I think it's your job as the composer to kind of you know 
be Switzerland in, in those <laughs> situations and try to see if there's a, a commonality or try to see if there's a way you can satisfy both sides. I mean, it's not all right. the time. There's a lot of majority of the time people have a, an agreement of what they want, but there's definitely these times where um, you have those situations that, that arise. And there's also scoring, film, TV. There's a lot of different stages too. You know, you have the compositional stage, you have the pre-production stage where we're spotting the film and we're trying to figure out where we want music, you know, in what scenes, what do we want the music to convey? These are things that are all being taken place before you're even writing a note of music. There's also yeah. the post-production side of it. After the music's written, we got to get the music recorded. We have to hire musicians. We have to get orchestrators. We have to, you know, to get a mixer to mix the film. You have to find a studio where you're going to mix the film at. You have to deal with different budgets, you know. So there's a lot of different things that go into it that's, that's, that's beyond the physical um, composition of music. So it's a pretty in-depth um, process. Right. I mean, music theory will always stay the same no matter what, and that's yeah. kind of the easy part. Yeah. It is, and it's also it's it's also the most important. You know, you can have the greatest samples in the world, the greatest sounds in the world, uh, the best equipment, the best mixer, the best orchestra, the everything top of the line. But if the notes don't work, the notes don't work. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, that is the foundation of everything, and and it, it always is the most important. But at the same time, too, you get to a you get to a certain level and everyone's really good at writing notes. You know what I mean? You get to a certain mm -hmm. level and um, there's not a lot of guys who are writing music for, you know, major television shows or movies that are bad. They might just subjectively, some people might prefer one to the other, but no one's bad at what they do. Everyone's very talented and they're very good at writing notes. So the other, you know, I always say, you know, 10% of getting a job is, is the music the other 90% is how do you deal with the director? Do you get along with them? Do you guys have a commonality in, in the language that you speak? Do you see the same vision that he sees? Um, how's your relationship with the studio? Do you get along with the producer? You know, it's all the other stuff besides writing the music that oh, ends yeah. up becoming very important in the hiring process. Um, and certain people fit really well together. Other people don't fit well together. And, and jobs kind of get sorted out that way in the upper ranks. So it's, yeah. um, it's a very interesting process to kind of get up through it if that makes sense right oh yeah it does now Good. speaking of collaborating with other people you've written the score for the hugely successful movie the maze runner plus its sequel the scorch trials you also won the annie award for scoring dragons writers of Burke for tv congratulations Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe includes both big screen and the small screen, and Daredevil's production is on such a huge scale compared to most TV shows. Did that affect how you composed for it? Yeah, another great question. You know, Dare it was funny because I've worked in network television and I've worked on features, and I almost feel like Daredevil and Netflix and the subscription services – almost fall somewhere between both worlds. Um, from a creative world and from a um, productional standpoint, they're very much in line with features. You know, they're, they're, they, they have, uh, they, they have a, a pretty, cinem pretty big cinematic feel to them. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest reasons, I think they're, the way that they go through production, it's almost like a movie, it's almost like a movie that's been cut up into 13 parts. And I think it, maybe it has to do yeah. with the way that they're released. When they release Daredevil, they release all 13 episodes, boom, all at once, and people can sit there and watch it like a movie, you know. And I think, I think that mentality is definitely, whether it's conscious or unconscious, is, is thought about as these things are being filmed, as the score is being done, as the effects are being done, as the sound's being done. People, I think, that are working on these projects really have this mindset of we're, we're, we're working on a film here. We aren't necessarily working on a show. When you're working on network television, you're so bound by the schedule. Um, you know, I, I just did a show for Fox called Second Chance. We have to have around thirty to you know thirty to thirty five minutes of score done every four days. Oh my um, gosh, that's a pretty tight schedule. You know, you're moving at a good clip um, when you're when you're performing and and having to write and produce and mix um, all that music a, in that short amount of time. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, when I'm working on a movie like Maze Runner, I might work on one minute 
of a four minute cue in five or six days. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you, you, there's a lot more, I don't want to say thought because one allows you more time to experiment, to, to play in the sandbox, sand, play in the sandbox, so to speak, than the other does. Um, so with, with network television, you got to kind of move quick because the schedule um, forces you to in, in many ways. Yeah. With, with the Netflix and, and the, the Marvel series that I've done for Netflix, um, it kind of falls somewhere in between uh, both, both those worlds. So um, they all kind of have different challenges and, 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 and some have advantages and disadvantages, but um, they definitely all, all pose a challenge as far as that situation goes. Yeah. Now, I love the combination of the musical styles with hearing that industrial grittiness of Hell's Kitchen and then hearing the classical orchestration mixed in. Um, it's really striking during that incredible hallway fight scene. I mean, the music really took that scene. I mean, it just took it to the next level. How much of the instrumentation throughout the series is influenced by elements of each character, like maybe Murdoch's re religious convictions or Foggy's idealism, things like that? Yeah, there, there definitely, you know, the, there was an overall theme when, when I first went into season one, Stephen um, Denight, who is the showrunner for, se for season one, really, really had strong convictions that he wanted. Um, there was a couple things that were important to him. He, I think he wanted to really make sure that the score is effective, but at the same time, too, we wanted the score to be grounded because we really felt that um, – it was important, and here I'll step back even further. The Marvel Universe has such a reputation for being this larger-than-life, fantastical, mm -hmm. um, very clean, very uh, fanfarish, traditional. You know, it has a very traditional superhero sound to it. From, a, and I'm speaking from a musical perspective, yeah. whether it's the yeah. Avengers or Captain America or, you know, there's, there's just a, 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 almost kind of an, an Americana superhero sound to it all. Mm -hmm. um, when we got into doing Daredevil, I think Steven really felt that Matt Murdock's character was, was such a different character than, your, than I think what people are traditionally seeing out of the Marvel characters that were kind of already presented in, this, in that universe. So it was important that we kept that the, that the music, you know, brought that element out of him. I mean, Mac Murdoch's a, a, a handicapped superhero. He lives in Hell's Kitchen. Um, it's a very grounded character. He's a lawyer. Um, you, a lot of people can relate to his character. There's, there's things that humanize him a lot more so than a lot of other characters, especially season one. He's not running around in a superhero outfit. Um, mm -hmm. He's kind of like a vigilante. Uh, right. So it was important, I think, when we set off to do the music for this, we wanted to make sure that the music let people in on that side of it. You know, we thought there's a tendency when you do large scale music and music that is larger than life and kind of suspends this a little bit, it, 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 it kind of pushes people out of the scene. Um, when you have music that's, that's kind of, and I, I use this term all the time, when you have music that's felt and not necessarily heard, it allows it, it kind of sucks people into a scene. You feel like you're standing there next to, you know, Mad Murdock and Karen in a scene, or mm -hmm. you, it invites people and it doesn't push them out and make them viewers. So mm -hmm. it was important that the score in general for Daredevil allowed for that, and also what that did, did too is it also allowed us to let people hear New York City. New York City's got a feel to it. It's got a sound to it. It's got an energy to it. And a lot of that, our, our sound team did a fantastic job um, creating that world. So we wanted the music and the sound to kind of live in harmony together. And, and the hallway fight's a great example of that. It's gritty. It's got energy. It's got pulsing. It's, it's, it, it's a dynamic cue because you have the initial fight in the hallway. Then it goes mm -hmm. into more of an emotional tone when Matt you know, picks up the boy and he's carrying him out mm -hmm. of the hallway and then we go into the Mad Murdoch theme as, it, as we go to the end of the scene. Um, it's a dynamic cue. But w what we did is we wanted to make sure that we had the energy during the fight, but we also wanted to make sure that people could hear the punches. We wanted to make sure that they could hear the grunts. We mm -hmm. wanted to make sure that they could hear all those um, efforts just because it, it brings people into the scene and makes them feel, uh, you know, part of it. Um, if we put big bombastic music over that whole scene, all of a sudden you're a viewer on your couch watching a fight scene. 
We really right. wanted to make people, you know, feel the hits and, and, and feel the efforts. And, and that way when you get to the end of the scene and you feel Matt carry the boy out and we get into the big emotional uh, daredevil cue, it pays off better. You know, you, all of a sudden now you're, you're involved with, with the theme and the music. And so it, there was very conscious efforts throughout the whole series to make sure that we allowed for a lot of moments like that. So in one aspect, it was the score was tricky because we're doing a superhero show, but at the same time, too, we want to make sure that um, it was grounded. We wanted to make sure that there was a lot of variety in it, but we also wanted to make sure that it was minimal at the same time. So it was challenging trying to accomplish all that stuff with minimal music. Um, but I think mm -hmm. it works. I think it works well. As, to, as far as Wilson Fisk goes, um, mm -hmm. I know I just gave you a super long answer for questions. Oh, no, that, that is <laughs> but perfectly as, fine. But as long as, as far as Wilson Fisk goes, yeah. we wanted to do the juxtaposition thing with him. He, he's this big, bullish, threatening character, but for some reason we put classical music behind him, light and sparse and elegant, and it just created this oh, off-kilter feel. It was um, beautifully and, complex. I mean, it, yeah, it really and, and, it, we, and it, it worked really well with him, even though he's, like I said, a, a character that, that demands a lot of respect and he's imposing and, and, and bullish, like I said. He, um, there's, a, there's a weird elegance about him, the way he carries himself. And, you know, he's clean cut and he wears nice suits and he's, he's got good manners. And, 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 but there's an evil twisted side to him and, and classical... Uh, music and not just any classical music, but for some reason it was lighter, fair classical music seemed mm -hmm. to, um, whether it was string quartets or or or, or you know pieces by Bach or uh, right. there was definitely a couple cues that were really inspiring that we used around Wilson Fisk that that worked really well. Then there was other times where I took classical pieces of music and I I twisted them up and you know, played them backwards or redid some of the harmony or, or put them through distortion or, you know, and mm -hmm. created a kind of a, a classical vibe, but, but really mangled and twisted. Right. So, and so to answer your question whole there, yeah, every characters definitely had their own world. Um, and season two, we, we get yeah. the same thing. I mean, we, we have all this jump. I'm, I'm sure I'm answering another question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But I think in season two, we do, we, it's, it's, it's even a broader story. There's even more characters involved. The height, the 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 stakes are higher. You know, there. Mad Murdock now is wearing his suit that was introduced in the last episode of season one. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 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 definitely we just keep kind of growing and maturing as from a from a score standpoint. Yeah, and Daredevil too has the additions of Elektra and the Punisher. Uh, what do their their characters and their themes bring to the overall? musicality of the show well it's great i mean i can't without divulging too much um, right. it was real. it was really nice to have a variety of characters to write for on season two versus season one we were we were kind of it was in, you know his origin story we're more centered around daredevil and, mm -hmm. and kind of how he came to be and um there was a little bit in there with you know his relationship with his father and some other stuff but Season two, we really get in t in depth with a, a host of other characters and 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 their relationships, how they correlate with each other, um, their stories, how they became, how they came to be. I mean, there's 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 a lot more depth, I think, and I think the fans are really going to enjoy that side of it. Um, and they all kind of have their own world, and all their worlds still have to kind of work within um, Daredevil's world. Um, and also too, I, it was also that was another challenge with season two. Season two, it was I didn't want to all of a sudden jump into, you know, a big super heroic, atypical score um, that you would hear in like you know Avengers or something. Because now you have all these characters that are all larger than life. I still wanted to keep it grounded. I still mm -hmm. wanted you know people to be relate to all these characters. I wanted them to feel as human as possible. Um, so it was still important to me to make sure that we we kept the intimacy of season one um, and bringing it into season two, but also make sure that people feel the, that there's definitely some more weight going on. And also, too, Marco and Doug did such a great job um, kind of carrying the torch from Steven um, with season two, and they, they just did a, a really, really great job making sure that we stayed on point and, and we didn't let it get away from us. 
um, as far as, especially from a music perspective. You know, it was it would have been really easy to say, oh man, we got you know Punisher, we got Electra, we really got to you know amp it up, and um, they were good with kind of you know making sure that everyone remained um, patient and 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 not you know overdo it. Right. Now, the main theme really gripped me when I first heard it, and I watched the images unfold on the screen. Everything was so beautiful and so dark and so compelling. And I understand that you've changed up the main theme for the second season. Could you tell us a little bit about that? No, actually, actually the theme is the same, believe it or not. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, they, they're, they're, they, 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 there, there may have. Been, I think there was some talk about maybe trying to do something, but I think because the main title, um, like you said, was so hugely popular, they just didn't even want to mess with it. It's it's become kind of a iconic signature to the to the show that I think they wanted to kind of keep it in line. It really has. Yeah. Now yeah. back back to the Maze Runner series. I understand that you're going to be working on scoring the next movie, Death Cure, mm-hmm. and yeah. that you're. And you're collaborating with the amazing Junkie XL on that. Now, since that movie is going to follow the novel a lot more closely, have you two started collaborating already with? No, I don't. Pocket? No, that might that may have been a um, like a misrep. I don't think Jun- Junkie's not working on, on Death. Oh, Care. okay. No, I think they had. There was a listing somewhere that there were that. I, I I read the same thing too. I know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I do start on that though. They start filming in. Um, I think they start filming in like six or seven days. I know. Oh wow. Uh, Wes is uh, getting ready to start shooting, and uh, I'm really excited to work on him. I mean, he's he's a great he's a great great guy to collaborate with. Um, he's one of those guys. I was telling you that when you get one of these jobs, you know, it's important mm-hmm. that you mesh with one of the, the guy that you're going to be working with and collaborating with, and. From day one, I met Wes. You know, I felt like he was my brother. I mean, we definitely got along great. We grew up on the same stuff: Spielberg and James Cameron and Ridley Scott. And, and we we have a very similar taste in music. He's a huge score fanatic. Um, he knows score just as well as anyone I know. Um, and he's just a great, great guy to work with. So I'm really, really looking forward to uh, jumping in and, and working on Death Cure. And I know that he's um, He's been working hard on, on getting ready to do the third one, so I am excited for him because I know he's itching to get started, and I know they start yeah. shooting up in Vancouver in, I think, six or seven days. That's great. Now, my last question is for anyone who's thinking about a career in doing what you do or being in the industry. Um, we know that making relationships with a variety of people in a lot of different areas is so important. Um, what advice would you give on someone who wants to get into the industry? I mean, how would you suggest they market themselves? I think the biggest thing is, you know, I think a lot of younger people, they, you know, I've, I think the the biggest key is you just have to be patient. You know, it's, it's not a, you know, I was, when I got Maze Runner, which was my first feature, I was 34, 35 years old, I think, when I got it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a little younger. I think I was 32. Um, but it took a long time. You know, it's not not to say that whole time I wasn't doing. I was still working behind the scenes. I was working with other composers, working with other guys. But it takes a long time to kind of get where you're trying to go. So I think if you can kind of go in with a plan and realize that it's going to take some time, um, and you have to allow yourself time to grow. I'm sure it could happen faster, but it, it might not. You know. So I think a lot of I think a lot of people burn out on this job because they get into it and they go, oh, I'm still not there. I'm still not there. I'm still not there. I'm just going to give up and do the hell with it. Um, right. I think it's important that you kind of have to just keep going. And it's like that with any job. I mean, you know, I don't, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a film composer or an architect or whatever you might want to do, it always takes time to, you know, get to where you want to go. Um, because film scoring is not such a defined path as some of those other occupations, I think it's a little bit more, um, it can be frustrating because I think, you know, it's kind of the Wild West when it comes to trying to figure out how to become a film composer. You want to be a doctor, you go to college, you do well, you get into med school, you do well in med school, you get a job at a hospital, you do your residency, you're a doctor. You know, film scoring, there's a thousand different ways to become a film composer. 
Um, right. So I think I think that poses a challenge for young kids trying to figure out how do I get to this position. There's no one way to do it. There's a lot of different ways, and I think it's patience um, that have to be in play to in order for you to suss out what way is going to work for you because every way uh, there's a different way for every single person to get there. Um, mm -hmm. So I think patience is a skill that you need to. Um, not every and, and also too, it's a skill that you need to acquire because I didn't have patience when I first started off doing this. It was, it was something that I kind of had to learn how to, you know, manage. And you have to have the drive and the desire to want to do it too. Otherwise, you just going to say the hell with it. I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to develop the patience skill for this thing. It's going to take too long. So you definitely know you you you. The first thing is you better love doing this might this better be the only thing you you want to do and you because you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to do it it's just that's the, right. that's the deal yeah so. perfect well thank you again for your time today thank you appreciate it yeah we've been talking with john paisano and daredevil 2 premieres on netflix on march 18th stay tuned to signalinks.com for the latest in movie news reviews and more